Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. All right. I am here today with my friend Ariel Hyatt from Cyber PR, and I'm excited to have her here. She's been on my podcast a few times, but this is a really exciting one because she's got a new book that just is coming out like as we speak here on the podcast. Um, I've seen all of her emails leading up to it, and she's got some pretty cool things that she's giving away to people that are like jumping on board on this launch and helping her really get it out in the world. I remember what that was like with my book too. So you, you got to get people excited. You got to get them like helping you and, and, you know, pushing it up the charts and all that stuff. So for you guys that are listening or watching right as this is happening in the launch, go give her some love. Um, we'll talk about how you can do that in a bit. But if you're seeing this later, this book will be available obviously um, forever on Amazon. So I think it's really a valuable resource for artists. And I know you will too, once we talk about it on the show. So um, her book is called The Ultimate Guide to Music Publicity. And um, first, before we get into the book, I just want her to give you just a short background on her experience in the music industry. I know she's been on the show before, um, but it's always good to get context before we get into the book. Thank you so much for having me, Bree. My name is Ariel Hyatt. And for the last 25 years, my company just turned 25, I have been at the helm of Cyber PR. Before it was called Cyber PR, it was called Ariel Publicity because I am the least creative namer of things alive. And um, we started as a traditional PR firm. Um, we adapted very early days. We became a digital PR firm. Then for a moment, we had a street team marketing company. We had a booking agency for a minute there. We also um, managed an artist. I gave that up like a bad drug habit. And today we do digital marketing, social media management. We write long-term marketing plans for our artists and we are still a digital PR campaign running company. That's that's what we do at Cyber PR. I love it. First of all, I can't believe we've been doing this for 25 years. That's that's pretty amazing. And I think I still remember when you were Ariel PR. When did you change the name? Um, I think it was around 2010, Yeah, that was like right when I became aware of you when I first started Women of Substance. That's so amazing. Yeah, you were one of the first all women podcasts that we ever even became aware of. I think you might've been the only one at the time. It was so amazing. So yeah. Yeah. And probably you've been, was. <laughs> yeah, you've been supporting our artists for all of these years. It's, it's been amazing. That's so cool. Um, so I know you've had a lot of other books, um, in the past, maybe you want to like, like, let them know, like the evolution of your, your book um, writing over the years and why, why this book now? So my first book was in 2007 and it was, it's a tongue in cheek title to this day. It's called music success in nine weeks. That book was basically a step-by-step -step primer for how as a musician to get up to speed on the digital trends that were happening. Twitter, <laughs> um, thinking about your newsletter, you know, all of these things that now are like, I mean, some of them aren't even really a thing. There, there was a whole chapter where we deeply encourage artists to blog for SEO, which I think when I look now 13, 14 years later, some artists took that path, many did not. The book, 
was self-published by me with a spelling mistake on every page, um, (laughs) (laughs) literally. And it was named by Derek Sivers. He came up with that name. And that was the book that sort of launched me off into loving writing and publishing books. I got smart and um, fixed all the spelling mistakes. That book has had um, three iterations. And since then I've written the musician's roadmap to Facebook and Twitter, which is now out of print because everything in it no longer applies. Mm. And then (laughs) I wrote cyber PR for musicians, which was basically a digital marketing overview. It did include Twitter and Facebook, but it had a lot of other tools and tricks and website things. And then a um, couple of years, about a year after that, there was a teacher's guide for cyber PR for musicians, which I was really happy about. Two pro- music industry professors wrote that as sort of a guide that goes along with, what is the word I'm looking for? A partner companion guide. Companion guide or something. Companion, yeah. thank you. Mm-hmm. Why can't I think of the word companion? Not enough coffee yet. Um, <laughs> companion guide. And then it ended up in a lot of schools and universities at music industry programs, which is something I'm really passionate about. So that was cool. Then I wrote Crowdstart, which is a book that was not only for musicians, it was for anyone looking to launch a crowdfunding campaign and how to do it effectively. It is still a top seller. That's the one I recommend to all my students. Yeah, it's still it's still rocking and rolling and it's out there and it's basically a 30-day roadmap for how to launch a successful crowdfunding campaign. That was five years ago. Um, so it was time to put out another book and I came back to the music industry. I took a look around and I asked my email list, you know, what is the area where they wanted to focus? And I realized two things. One, There is no book that only focuses on music publicity. There are many, many books that have a chapter that talk about music PR that are out, but there's not one that gives a fully deep dive. There hasn't been one available to the public. There are some textbooks. Um, Since the Billboard Guide to Music Publicity, which was published in 1994. So... Um, I thought it would be nice to fill a hole in the music book world. And um, now, why now? I think we're all hopefully coming out of this pandemic and things are beginning to open up and artists are beginning to get back on the road. I know so many artists got kicked in the teeth with what's gone on with losing income And I know many are not going to have extra budget when they start bringing money back in from live shows to hire publicists. That should be the last thing, or at least one of the things further down on the list. So I thought, let me make a guidebook for artists that are coming back after this crazy year so that they could follow a step-by-step guide to do it themselves. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Like we are all kind of ramping up again. And um, I love that you're you're teaching artists to do this, even though you have a firm that does this for artists, right? But I think that you know it, it's it's a path for artists, and I don't think that they should be investing in even you know awesome campaigns like yours when they first start out. So when when do you recommend that artists do their own PR and follow what's in your book versus actually going out and hiring someone like you? So there is an entire section in the book about how to hire a publicist because that's a whole other bag of worms. That's a tricky question to answer really because first of all, you have to ask yourself, can I tolerate doing PR? If PR is something that you're interested in doing, it's a good question. I think that if you look at any kind of business mastery, which I know you teach, One of the most revelatory things for me when I was trying to get a handle on mastering my own business was you don't have to do the things that you hate. You don't have to. Even if you don't have an enormous budget, you can figure it out. So I remember I went to this big business growth marketing conference because I like conferences. I like being in community with people when I learn things. And the teacher said something that really hit home for me. And he said, the minute you have money, there's two things you should outsource, getting your toilet and your house cleaned and your 
accounting. And he said, look, if you're totally into QuickBooks and that's like your jam, don't outsource the accounting. If you love filing your own taxes, cool. But he said for most people, he said the four hours or the three hours that it takes to clean your toilets and scrub your sinks and get on your hands and knees, he's like, that is your thinking time. That is time for, imagine what you could do if you could have four hours to just focus on your business. You could probably come up with something that will generate 150 bucks, which would be the amount of money that you would take to pay said person to clean, right? So that really hit home. Um, and also I had put myself into a QuickBooks class and I was schlepping on Saturday mornings down to this like adult learning center and like forcing myself to learn how to use QuickBooks. And I hated it and I didn't like it and I didn't want to do it, but I felt like a responsible business owner has to do it. And I realized it gave me the permission to hire a bookkeeper. So um, if bookkeeping and toilet cleaning feels the same to you as publicity, forcing yourself to do it, if it feels confronting, if you don't like it, if, if you're not into that kind of aggressive follow-up and all of that, definitely try to figure out a way to, to, to outsource it if it's on your desire list, for sure. I'm curious though, because there's this line of like, I'm scared of it and I don't understand it. And I also hate promoting myself because so many artists feel super weird about promoting themselves versus like, if I really learned it, I could, I could like it. Um, and also just like, how do you get over that hump of like, not wanting to promote yourself in general as an artist, because we do have to get over that, whether we're going to do our own publicity or not. Agree. And I think that's where the inner work comes. If you're having some sort of like crazy reaction to self-promotion, there's something there about being seen that's totally freaking you out. There's something there. It's really interesting to me that so many artists have no problem recording and releasing music. They have no problem being on stage. I mean, these are things being on stage is like the number one fear for like most people would like rather die than be on stage literally. And so it's interesting that musicians like no problem getting on stage, but huge problem doing this sort of other types of things that are putting yourself out in front of people. But it's I so do true. Think, like we're willing yeah. to like write a song about our innermost thoughts and share it on stage, but we can't, you know, approach someone and say, Hey, you know, I have this story idea. <laughs> right. And I think that part of that is we look at a lot of other people doing things and we sometimes don't like what we see don't look at people's bad promotion because then you're going to make a story about, oh, promotion sucks. No, that person sucks. <laughs> so the other thing about this book is I'm really trying to just demystify the whole process. And I'm so honored that you and about 60 other people made contributions to this book. Music publicists, playlisters, podcasters, music journalists, music bloggers, music freelancers, other musicians. There's 11 musicians that tell their journey of how they became masters at their own publicity and their own PR, because there is a bit of a distinction between PR and publicity. So this book is really took a village. And I think that if you read it and you read all those quotes and, and sort of golden nuggets of information that everybody shared, the demystification light should go on. And I hope that it will just feel less stressful and daunting when you realize, just like I tried to do with CrowdStart, if you have a system that you're following and you take the story of how scary it is out of the system and just follow the system, you might get much further than when you're trying to figure it all out and then you get doubly confronted because you're trying to figure something out that you don't know how to do. And you're adding that element of self-promotion, which even for people who are excellent at self-promotion, they also hit walls. They just don't show it in the way that you might think they, they would. Mm, mm, very true. Very true. And I definitely want to get into the, the contributions to the book because I think they're really, really valuable. Um, 
but first I wanted to ask, cause I've actually not really known this. What is the difference between publicity and PR? So these are words that get collapsed often. And I know I do it. I, I, I interchange them. Yeah. And I think in today's sort of modern marketing world, they are somewhat interchangeable. Publicity is the practice of creating something like a pitch or a press release and putting it out in front of the media. Now, what has changed sort of radically since I've been doing publicity, and it's even changed radically in the last couple of years, is the media has gone from the sort of more traditional things that we think of, newspapers, magazines, television, radio, to playlisters and podcasters and bloggers and tastemakers could even be considered um, media. If there's someone that has like a tremendous amount of followers and they're going to do a post for you on their socials, this is where the sort of PR and publicity lines begin to blur. PR is public relations. So public, your fans, people in the music industry, um, everyone else out there, not the media, that's your public and relations, how you are relating to them. How are you communicating to them? So there's all kinds of things that are PR-ish, throwing events, um, social media is definitely PR, writing your newsletter. All of these things, I think, fall into the PR bucket. Um, so that that's the distinction. Oh, that makes a lot of sense now that you say that, because as soon as you said that, it was like, yep, social media, that is PR. Um, yes. And you might, and then here's another blur. You might be trying to get the attention of someone in the media using Twitter or using Facebook or using an IG direct message. Um, but that's, that's, that's where it gets blurry, right? Because, and that's where I think publicists, back in the day when I started a digital PR firm, every publicist that I talked to was horrified. Oh, you're going to talk to bloggers? They're not journalists. You know, there was this like this ridiculous, you know, attitude. And I also didn't understand the difference. I was trained at some of the top music and fashion PR firms in the world. Like, I mean, rigid, structured. And so I didn't know what I was doing when I first heard of podcasts. So I wrote a press release, like a very formal, this is what you're going to get. And I remember sending it out to some of the earliest podcasters and people lambasted me. They were like, what are you doing? This is not how, you know, and I realized really fast, like, oh, podcasting is completely different milieu. It's, it doesn't, doesn't, require that you're formally pitching a journalist. So um, I, I, got, I got a big up in comments from a bunch of people in the podcasting community, most of whom don't podcast anymore, but they were like tastemakers in 2006, seven. And I learned, oh, in order to pitch a podcaster, you have to have a whole other approach. So this book also talks about that. Like, how do you approach a playlister that's different from how you approach a podcaster. It's different from how you approach someone you know. For example, I'm now on your podcast in a few weeks. Um, you and me and Katie, you'll be on my podcast. I don't need to write you a formal thing. I've known you for forever, right? So there's all different levels of how you're going to communicate. And that's, um, that's important to understand when you're trying to get publicity. Yeah, and I love that the the quotes that you got from people like me who are podcasters and you know have their platform, that helps people understand that because that was part of one of my quotes. I'm like, you you asked me like, what do you look for? You know, what is a good pitch to you for your podcast? And I'm like, here's all the things that you should not do. Yeah, I will not. First of all, my assistant won't even pass it on to me because I get. I get multiples per day and my podcast is not any huge. I can't even imagine people that are on like the, you know, iTunes top 50 or whatever are getting, if I'm getting that many pitches. So I, I love that you are getting basically directly from the tastemakers, the podcasters, the bloggers, the, 
you know, the digital media owners, how they like to be approached. And that's something that I don't really see any other book doing. And you're getting it right directly from us. You're not just like assuming or whatever. Like you, you got us to say exactly what we love, exactly what we hate. And yeah. um, I think that's going to make people feel like way more comfortable starting to do PR if you've never done it before, because you already have been told directly what these people want. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That that was the idea. And I have to say, it felt really vindicating when the quotes came back because they were in alignment with what I was writing about in the text, but it was just, it was so nice to have backup, right? And it was so nice. And people really generously gave, I mean, people gave secret sauce, you know, that it was really amazing, especially the music publicists that, you know, music publicists can tend to be a little bit um, territorial sometimes about what they do and what they know. Uh, many of them have always wondered how the hell I stay in business because I give away everything, but you know, it's called an education platform. It's not how most publicists think, but that's okay. Um, yeah. So I really did love all of those contributions from, from, from everyone and many people I knew and many people, the, the fun part was a lot of the people that sent quotes, I didn't know them. I got to know them as I was including them in my book. And that was really fun too. That, that is cool. I mean, that's what happens when you have a platform like a book, you can actually reach out to people that you don't know yet. And, you know, they're, they're going to want to get involved because you have a platform and then you get to know people. That's what's great about a platform. I've met so many people just because I have podcasts that I would never have met before. Um, so I know you've got, you've got the industry side and the, the media side, and then you've also got the artist side. So you, you think you said you had 11 artists kind of journeys in there. Are there a few that you'd like to highlight that you think would really excite people to go pick up the book? Yes. Um, so there are 11 sort of full featured sections. And then there are many, many other artists where we have examples of their bios and their pitches. And so it's, it's many more than 11, but two that stand out for me. One is a woman who I know has been on your podcast in the past. Her name is Maya Azucena. And Maya has been someone I've known for many years. She actually sang on um, the album of the artist that I managed all those years ago, Pete Miser, an amazing hip hop artist from Brooklyn. Maya, I watched Maya go from the type of artist who looked a lot like every artist we know, grinding it out, playing gigs, releasing stuff. And she found a niche. And the niche that she found was social justice, and especially for women and women's equality. And she began to show up and play at all kinds of dinners, um, parties, marches, events where people were talking about equality for women. And she became an ambassador in that world. So that whenever anyone was having like a gala dinner, guess who would get invited to sing? Mm. Whenever anyone was having a fundraiser, guess who would get invited to be the host? So she found that niche. And out of that, um, her music was always, was, was always on brand. So it wasn't like that didn't fit in perfectly with who she was, but she then began to create songs for specific charities and create songs that were about women being empowered. And then because of who she is and because of her sort of generosity with giving of her time and playing these galas and playing these benefits, she started getting paid to play things like that. And then she started getting invited and she got invited by the United Nations to go travel, to do uh, women's events and girls initiatives globally. She got invited by all kinds of people and she spends most of her time, not in the United States, but touring globally, um, connecting to people of the world. And her story I think is revelatory because she had this moment where she went, I don't have to just worry about people in Brooklyn like the world can be my market and the world is concerned about women because women make up actually more than 50% of the world. So that is a market, right? It's a brilliant market. It's not that she only plays for women, but pretty much anywhere you go, you can find initiatives where people are helping women. 
So I love that about her. The other artist I will talk about is an artist by the name of Ileana Kadushin. She's a very good friend of mine, has been since she and her husband, James Harrell, hired me. Their band is called Lithion. I publicized them in 2001. That was their debut album. And they are a husband and wife duo. He does a lot of film scoring. Her gig is she's a voiceover artist, actress, um, when, she, when they're not making music. And Ileana has a great voice. She became the voice of the Twilight series. So if you, if you oh, buy wow. the books on tape, she's also the voice of Dune. Um, so she's, she's, she's created a lot of amazing um, voiceover work. And she's very, very um, interested also in giving back in social justice, in charities, in, and where she um, resonates is with older people. So when Hurricane Sandy hit, um, she, I and my husband and she and her husband volunteered right in our neighborhood in Brooklyn. There was a local, um, a local armory that filled to the brim with people whose nursing homes had been flooded. They were literally flooded out of their homes and they were lined up on cots in the armory under these horrible fluorescent lights. And we went in and my husband was helping people on and off toilets. I was making coffee in the break room for the Red Cross workers. James and Ileana came and they realized that all these people were agitated. They were freaked out. And Ileana and James brought their guitar and they sang for people and they watched people's energy change and shift. That helped her birth something called Stories Love Music, which is now a charity that helps people with Alzheimer's as well as caretakers connect to music. They also created a podcast called Now I Know. Know I Know, and it's a husband-wife podcast. They are interviewing interesting people that are making change all over the country. They're on NPR in their home state of Maryland. And Ileana's entire contribution to the book is about having a hyphenated career. And I'm sorry, this is such a long answer, but I wanted to give you a sense of how to make your music career work maybe doesn't just look like I play a gig, I promote it, I play a gig, I promote it, I put out a record, I promote it, I kill myself, I'm hustling. Maybe there's other areas of interest where you can do what Ileana says, which is hyphenate. So her story is so inspirational to me. You've done that, Brie. You have the same kind of journey of, of a hyphenated music career. Um, so I'm sure you can resonate with Ileana. I can. And, and it's interesting because I, I didn't do it on purpose to begin with, like a lot of these people that you mentioned, right? I was like, I just feel like women aren't represented enough on the radio. And that was my whole goal. And then I just, I naturally fell into, oh, I have this huge audience of women. I started working with them and I've become known as that person. And it's opened a lot of doors for me that probably it wouldn't have been open before. And like you said, I become known as that person. So if someone wants to talk about women in the industry, they call me, even though I'm like, I'm not an expert on this, you know, but when you, when you focus on one thing and you really just kind of hone in on that and do a lot of then publicity around that thing, then it's just like a continuous cycle, right? Because you become known as that person, just like you are kind of known as the music PR person, I think. And so when someone says, oh, we need someone to talk about PR, like you're the first person that they call because you've been in it for a long time and you always talk about, you know, the same thing, a, a lot of the same things. And so any, any way we can do that as musicians. And I love these ideas of, you know, particular causes, or you know, particular particular groups of people that we want to support. Um, I, I I heard somebody talking. I think it was um, I think it was Christina Kano. She was talking about how she talks about baths all the time because her album is about baths. And I was like, well, that is really interesting. But you know, I mean, whatever your your thing is, you, if you talk about it enough, you get it out into the media enough, then you're going to be the person that people call when they want to talk about that thing. Yeah. 
in my mind, I just thought of like, oh, she could market bath salts or those <laughs> pillows or candles, you know? And again, like if you, if you, if you do have a thing that you're passionate about, that you're talking about, that you're doing all kinds of other opportunities come into the picture, you know, it's, it's baths. I don't know. Like people might think of her constantly about like, okay, we're, we're, we're talking about mental health. Let's interview her about how that could be really helpful in your canon of tools. Right. Yeah. Like something as odd as that. Right. When I heard that, I was like, that is really interesting. But then, you know, your mind starts spinning. Well, how could I, what are the, like the tangential things that you right. can relate to that? Talk about a niche. And that is really what PR is or publicity. Yes. Right. Yes. That is is what finding those connections. Yes. Yes. And the book also does do a really deep dive about that. Like you have to find those connections or you're not going to be interesting to the media. Just having a record coming out and having a genre and talking about the producer, that's like what the other 50,000 people that went up on Spotify today just did. You know, you have to find that, that nugget, that hook we talk about in the bio section of what hooks people in and what keeps them interesting. And your hook can change over time. It's not about come up with a thing and stick with it um, for 25 years. You can be parent, you can be, um, you know, kind of flowing between hooks for your whole career and change it up like Ileana has, like you have, you just keep building as you go. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So let's talk about the launch of this book. I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I, I know, I know you're like willing to be like totally transparent. So I'd love to know, cause musicians go through this kind of stuff all the time when they're launching their music, like glitches happen and like the thing doesn't come out when you wanted it to come out and there's issues with you know whatever they're not putting it out on the website on time like what has this journey been like can I curse no I won't curse it's been a (laughs) shit show that's what this launch has been like Oh See, my musicians, God. It's not just you. This stuff it happens is, to everyone. <laughs> and it's really funny because we work with so many musicians and we write marketing plans for them and we help them roll out their album and they call hysterical on that Friday when their album didn't hit Spotify <laughs> and CD baby doesn't know why. Like it, it happens all the time. Right. And it's really upsetting when it happens because you're planning and it's your baby and you work so hard. And then, so, um, Yes, I've been having a crazy show on Amazon. Somehow I have not one, not two, but three author accounts. And no one at Amazon can help me. I have spoken to the Philippines. I have spoken to India. I have spoken to a lovely woman in South Africa. I've spoken to a woman who works from home. I heard her kids screaming in the background and dogs. I think she was in Kentucky and no one can help. It's like a joke. So then I went on women in music and I was like, okay, I'm literally asking for a miracle here. I I want, I need a miracle. And 25 people, 25 people who work at Amazon responded to me. Not one of them can help. Wow. (laughs) One woman From the women in music list, which by the way, if you're a woman and you're not in women in music, you definitely need to join it. It is one of the most supportive and amazing communities. One woman said, please don't think I'm insane, but here is Jeff Bezos's personal email address. She gave me his email address. She said, I have emailed him over the years when crazy stuff has happened to me and he doesn't write back, but there's a team of people, they write back. I did it. The team of people wrote back and it, it was so surreal to read an email that said, Jeff Bezos has passed your email on to me, which of course is not true, but felt true and felt really cool. And oh my God. (laughs) And we are looking into the problem and it came from the Amazon executive team. So I, I have been up leveled. I'm I'm executive. (laughs) And my problem still exists. And I haven't heard from her since last Sunday and it is now Friday. So anyway, we lumber on, I think, you know, the best way to handle this kind of crazy show when it happens to you, if it happens to you in the middle of your album release or tour, think about all the people that when the pandemic hit, they just had to cancel everything, pull the plug, change, change lanes, 
honesty is your best policy. If anyone's on my mailing list, you know, I'm just sending emails going. That's how I knew. You didn't even tell like, me because I read like, it in your email. <laughs> Like, I don't know why when you click on this link, it sucks. I don't know why it, it was supposed to come out on this date and it's not, I, sorry, it sucks. Um, but what you hope for is that you can be transparent with your fans, your community, your list, your people. And it's been really nice. People have written me back and said, I'm so sorry you're going through this. I, I bought the book anyway. I bought the old book because the old book was connected to the new book. It was, it was such a mess. Um, so. I think there's a lesson in having a messy launch, <laughs> right? And the lesson is calm down. This book will be out for a long time. It's not only out on June 17th. It's out for a long time, years. I tried to write it in an evergreen way so that if you read it in a year, it still feels fresh. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, there's nothing I can do about this. Like I, Amazon is a behemoth. Spotify is a behemoth. Apple Music is a behemoth. This is sort of our reality as creators in today's marketplace. Um, and the lesson is like, try to roll with it as much as you can, I think. Yeah. I mean, for all those people that have had similar problems, Spotify has multiple artist accounts for you. You know, your account has been deleted by them for no reason. You know, these things happen. Yeah. And it totally sucks. Yeah. But I hope this makes you guys realize that there is like, none of us are immune to it because we don't control the digital world and we just have to do the best we can. And honesty is the best policy. Your yeah. audience will respect you so much when you just come out and say, hey, this is what's happening and it sucks. Yeah, yeah. Well, all of that being said, how can people get a hold of this book? Um, and also I know you've got a few like cool things coming up, whether they're watching this later, obviously they can't be involved in that, but I know you've got like a cool launch party going on and all the things that we would do as musicians, right? If we were launching a release. Yes. So um, here's what you can do. I'm going to create a landing page just for you and your listeners where you can actually buy the book, the digital book for seven bucks. Um, it's like nine bucks or something on Amazon, but I'm so tired and exhausted from the drama. Um, so you'll be able to get it directly there. Once you get it, I'll see that you bought it from me. Unlike when you buy at Amazon, then you have to like send me a proof of purchase and then you forget to do that. And then I don't know you have it and then it gets worse. So Brie will have a link. She'll put it in the show notes. It will be buy the book for $7 or you can buy it on Amazon. If you do that, send me an email um, and let me know. I will cordially invite you to my Zoom book launch party, which will be the 17th of June. And for everyone that buys the book, I am giving away, um, it's a raffle. So when you buy it, you get entered into the raffle to get a free deluxe PR campaign. The value of that is $3,000. I wanted to sweeten the deal. So if you have a, a release coming out or if you have a release that's already out, but you feel like you didn't get the up and comments that you deserved in the media world, we will publicize your music with joy. Mm. That's huge. You guys want to win this thing. So definitely seven bucks by the book. It will be <laughs> worth it just for the media member quotes that are in there. If not everything else that's in there. So thank you so much, Ariel. I really appreciate you sharing all of this with everybody. And I'm just really excited about this book coming out. I, I do feel like I get a ton of questions about PR and I'm certainly no expert. <laughs> at all. You know, I've definitely done it for myself. I have my own experiences. You know, I've talked to plenty of people like you, but it's not the same as somebody that's doing it in the trenches all the time. So I know this book is going to be really helpful for everybody. So you guys go out and get it. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for always supporting women and for always supporting me. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. 
thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 